Hello, amateurs. Welcome to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host, Tim, and I've got another fantastic guest for you today. This man played for Wasps, Harlequins and Blackheath. He coached England and Kenya Sevens and is currently head coach of USA Sevens. And what's really relevant to today's conversation is that he's got two sons who are both developing into fine young players. Please welcome Mr. Mike Friday. Giza, how are you? I'm all right, Tim. Yourself, mate? It's good to be, uh, good to be back in the mix. Um, talking Absolutely. About- yeah, I'm very well. Uh, and as Mike alludes to there, he is a former podcast guest already. Episode number eight uh, was Mike's one. So if you want to go and listen to that, we talk a lot about uh, Giza's story, like how the fact we played with them and against each other. Mike coached me when we were both at Blackheath. So there's loads of great stuff there. If you want to find out about all of that, go and listen to episode number eight. But in this episode, we're going to be talking about one specific area, and that is player development and the sort of the player pathway in England. So, Giza, I know you've got a lot of experience in this from coaching at clubs where we've had uh, dual qualified players come in on loan from premiership clubs. And as I mentioned in the intro, your boys as well are going through that process or have been through that process. If you, can you just sort of expand on that and sort of describe your experience in, in coaching elite young players? Yeah, and it, it, I mean, again, it's, it, it, is a, it is, again, it's a different level to what happens at kind of grassroots and community in the minis and junior section, right? Which is about participation, enjoying the game, fun, development you know, smiles on faces and coming back the next week, that's what success looks like. And I'm not suggesting that's not the the same when you get to the elite development part of the game as well, but it does change. It does get serious. Um, And you're in that transition place as a a young man or a a mature teenager and a boy becoming a young man and, and finding your way in the in the world of rugby, which is an unforgiving place at the elite end. And you go from being a superstar at your age group, a superstar at your grassroots club, um, to all of a sudden being a very small fish, trying to find your way in a big pond with a lot of sharks. And I think that whole transition is quite daunting um, for, for young players. You know, Having seen it kind of firsthand um, being at Blackheath and, and absorbing those younger players, actually seeing it, how it's evolved and changed now, um, even at the school end, the higher end, the kind of 16, 17, 18s end, and how that translates into the academy system um, and how it is becoming very much a business and highly, highly ruthless, whereby you are judged as young players um quite harshly at times um although although you try and feed back or they are the the players are fed back to it in in a meaningful and empathetic way at the end of the day it's not necessarily what you say it's what they hear uh and and it and it can be harshly treated and and you know again educating young players that this is what they do not who they are is still quite tough to do right with with the power of social media now and how that's become such a a staple part of all of these young men and young women's um, lives. So I think there's a lot more challenges um, that, that that younger guys and younger girls have now got to face as they try and plot their way through the professional game. And it's become harder and the, and the filter has become tighter. But more importantly, the talent pool has broadened and uh, it's, it, it's, it's a big place, right? I mean, let's just look at Rosalind Park Sevens last, last week. I, I think it was like 15,000 boys and girls playing the sevens in a week. I mean, that's nuts. And, you know, that, that's not all the schools. That's just the schools that go and participate. So competition is fierce, right? Um, and, you know, to plot and find your way, it, it can be it can be very, very hard. Um, and giving perspective as along those way along the way for the for the for the athletes of both the both the boys and the girls i think is is critical um part of of that kind of coaching pathway yeah for sure now i mean i've had some of the young players that i played with on the podcast people like sam smith and tom lindsay and they describe their sort of time in the national leagues on loan as being absolutely crucial to their development, both as a both as a human, but as a player as well. Um, so 
I, I hear a lot that the players aren't playing enough, that these young kids aren't playing enough. Yet, like in my experience, you know, those two guys played a lot of rugby uh, in national leagues and they both loved it and they both developed. So what's missing here? Why, why, why is this being talked about as the players aren't yeah. playing enough? I, I think it's, it's an interesting concept because I think they play a lot of school um, and they're playing, you know, there's a lot of demands on their time right so again if i if i look at lucas my lucas and what he's had to put although he's had a terrible injury time for the last eight months but last year is a really good example he he has his grassroots club bromley which is still true to his heart he's been there since he's five so you know he's got mates there right and that's part of him and that's very much in his dna so he's got a a, a want and a desire to participate there he has the the demands of the school and the school fixtures and the cups that they're going for, the National Cup, the Rosen Park Sevens, as well as the, the 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 daily or the weekly friendlies. He then has the Harlequins, where he again he's he was he's fighting to make sure he, he's in that under 18s team that, that's playing in the academy, and then he's chasing the the representative honours. So the demands on the players in that kind of last couple of years at school are, are huge, you know, and they've got a lot to balance on as well as on top of their studying. <laughs> which all parents are on top of as well. So, and then you go from that to then you, you if you're fortunate enough to to be kept on and put onto academy contract, you now now you've gone from being that as you said that big fish to that to being that small fish. But then you've got not only the rugby part, you've got the physical development part because now, as you know, when you look at the rugby athletes that play the game, they're a lot bigger they're a lot stronger um, and they're a lot fitter. And even that has changed over the last 10 years from when Tom Lindsay started as a young man, when when Sam Smith started as a young man and, and, and other guys, right? So being able to cope physically has become a big part of it. So what you see is there's a lot of physical development, which sometimes means you have to sacrifice other parts of, of the jigsaw. And that then talks about, as you talk about that kind of, technical and tactical and that just just getting the experiences and playing the games and I think getting that healthy balance is difficult I think it's subjective I think no two players are the same but the problem is that everybody thinks they're getting a harsh deal or it's not quite going how they want so I think for halfbacks playing is very very important for a front five you know Joe Marler will certainly advocate getting dealt with by Des Brett would have been a, a, a huge advantage to him. But I think as well for centres and back rows and all that, that physical piece is, is important. So I think the development part of, of where they play and how they play, I think, looks like it's stifled. But I think it's quite bespoke and it's probably not right for, you know, they probably feel it doesn't don't get it right all the time. Um but in that first year, you've got to get the balance right between playing and adjusting and, and realising and recognising what it is to be a pro player. Uh, and and as, as we know, adjusting to be a professional player is not as glamorous as people think um, with all of the video analysis work, the, the physical preparation, the recovery, um, all of the, the those parts of the games, which are not the sexy bits, right, which are not chucking a ball about on a pitch are helping you to become the player that you need to be in kind of four or five years alongside hopefully which i think is fundamental in young players is that they are either following some sort of academic course or some sort of practical trade apprenticeship to ensure that they are laying foundations now for life after rugby whenever that may be because sadly rugby is never going to probably deliver the rewards that football does and more importantly, it means that it, it can all be over very quickly. It means you are going to have to go to work at some point. So I think I think the game's changed in terms of the physical requirements, which means now it looks like rather than just chuck them on loan and leave them there, they're, they're very more bespoke playing programmes, which can be frustrating for young players who have gone from playing a lot to suddenly not playing so much. Yeah, well, and... How, how has this changed over the years as well, Giza? Like, is, is that kind of you've got to the point there where we're talking about the current system, but like go back 10, 15 years, were we seeing players who were sort of 
much more talented and spending much more time on the pitch. And therefore, you know, the sort of physical development came later when they got into sort of adult rugby. I just think physical development, you know, it's, it's all kicked on, right? It's all kept moving forward. So I think physical development now has become critical. Whereas probably back 10, 15 years ago, it didn't need to be as fiercely focused on because players weren't as big. And it's not to say that the highly, you know, a, a talented player is a talented player, 100%, right? But a good big and always beats a good little one. So, you know, there's many different ways you can kind of look at it and you, and, you, and you can skin it. And I think, you know, what they're trying to build is premiership athletes. So they're looking at things over a one to four year span, not what players are looking for. And all young players are in a hurry, right? They're looking at... Um, kind of the next six, 12 months. And I, and I think there's got to be perspective. And I'm not suggesting that you, you don't learn from playing because I'm a big believer in you've got to play to, to learn and you've got to get it wrong to get it right. But it's just finding that balance. And I think the challenge is making sure that the player understands his journey over those kind of those one to three years. And, you know, I think the challenge we have as well alongside this is, right, there aren't as many clubs and as many teams that can absorb these players because they're all kind of chasing their own battle right I mean if you think back in the day you know there was a each of the national one clubs would have had a first a second and a third team and you know the championship clubs would have had a first and a second and a third team even the the premiership clubs would have had a first and a second team so there was many many more opportunities to get games and what we've seen is we've seen that that's that has um, that has become a more condensed and claustrophobic part is that these feeder clubs, let's just say, or these experienced clubs, these development clubs, these semi-pro um, community clubs, they're operating kind of tighter squads and they're building to survive for themselves um, and not able or, or it doesn't necessarily suit them to absorb loan players or 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 take players kind of on an ad hoc basis. And then you've got the premiership players again, those clubs going, well, you can have him this night, but you can't have him that night. Well, that doesn't work for the National One clubs. As we know, back then it was like, you're either with us or you're not. And that's the same for the player, right? He doesn't know whether he's coming or going. So I think there's there's two or three things that are going on here, which means that it becomes very hard for those younger players to get continuity in their playing experience to allow them to evolve and develop. Yeah, and that was something, <clears throat> excuse me, that was something Sam Smith picked up on as well, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was that playing for a whole season at Blackheath and then at Isha, like he yeah. sort of understood what it meant to grow as a team and to bond as a team and to understand each other's playing styles and playing systems. And you're saying that's really not happening now? Yeah, I'm saying it's harder to, for it to happen. I mean, you, you, you've seen many different ways they're trying to skin it, right? You've seen alliances from certain clubs to others, you know, like, for example, Saracens working with Old Albanians or Bedford or, um, you know, Harlequins working now like, with their alignment with London Scottish, but then they have relationships with Worthing and they have relationships with Richmond. But, you, you know, it's it's not as fluid as it used to be. Um, and the accessibility to the players for those clubs is less because of the constraints and the parameters that the players are being put on with the premiership clubs. So it's, it's a real healthy balance because, it, because they're looking at the performance side and ultimately it's become so competitive at the top now for, for young players to get an opportunity that the physical preparation, whether we agree with it or not is, is becoming key. And then what they do, in the training week with Harlequins, because ultimately, say at Harlequins or at Saracens, they've still got to win their game every Saturday. And if that means that they need their whole squad in to to run opposition work and things like that, as a young player, you, you've, you've got to realise and recognise your role in that. And you've got to be selfless for the club and the team because that's part of team culture and that's part of being part of being a professional as well, as well as them paralleling to to allow you to get your player development piece as well. So it's it's just become quite claustrophobic because I think money's tighter and that's at all levels, which means less teams are able to be financed or 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 run. 
Um, and, you know, that's before we look at kind of even lower down at the community level where, you know, clubs, I think, are starting to swell a little bit more and get three teams out. And now we're working to get four teams. So we're seeing that kind of at the real social level. But this is like the semi-serious level going into the into the elite level. And, and there's, there's a bucket load of really good players that yeah. then become disillusioned or, or discontented because it, they've gone from being this to suddenly not being needed or wanted and then they give the game up. Yeah, which we really want to try and avoid for sure. Now, in the recent under-20s Six Nations, there were some sort of quite alarming stats, in my opinion, about how many elite games the England youngsters have played compared to the French. Now, is what you've just sort of spoken about there in terms of the size of the game and the number of teams that are putting out, does that kind of explain it? Because obviously, uh, in France, they've got Pro de Deux, which is a very, very high level, and the third division as well. And some of these players are playing a lot of sort of first-team rugby at that level. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, that, I mean, that ultimately is it, right? And and slightly systems are slightly different. But the reality is in France, we know there's more money. <laughs> um, obviously, we know there's more money. Um, but there's more money at all levels of the game. And they, they're a far bigger um, rugby country in terms of physical size and number of teams that are able to operate at those three levels. And that allows them to, again, they've worked really hard to increase their numbers of French players, right? I mean, you can see that because that's it's starting to filter up now to the top 14 teams as well at those kind of 20, 21-year-olds. But there is more playing opportunities for them. Um, interestingly enough, when you, you, know, you, like, you look at the French pack as well, they're physically at that under-20s level, physically, <laughs> they're big lads. So they, <laughs> they've got a, a, a bigger gene pool as well to pull on, a more diverse gene pool that they bring in. So I think there's a, there's an element of that in terms of physical development seems to be a little bit earlier, um, together with the fact that there is just more playing opportunities at the right levels, um, which are which are being afforded to them. And then you know when you look at the French game, they've still got their kind of semi-pro and below club participation game, which is is still strong as well. So. I think that's that's a key thing on the stats. I think when you look at, you know, the other teams, you know, Ireland have a very good system, um, but but they are more, as I understand it, with Ireland, I think that the 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 pe the, the young guys up to the age of nineteen twenty, they play in the club system, and then they become more into the academy system when they're kind of twenty twenty one onwards, and they either accelerate or they continue on their development pathway. And we we can't forget in all this. Rugby is still a late development sport. And yet we are accelerating our youngsters 18, 19, 20 when the top of the game is physically far more powerful and stronger and expecting more out of them. So, you, you know, and then there's a sense of, well, do we continue to invest or do you move on to the next one? And that's, again, the ruthless cut cutthroat part of, 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 rug, of the rugby business, which is probably being exaggerated because of, because of cash or lack of, or, or sustain, su su sustainability of the game at the top level. Yeah. Okay. This sounds like a really good time to jump into the different kind of systems that we've had in this country. Because obviously, in the olden days, when me and you were playing, Mike, you know, yeah. you'd play well for your club, get selected for your county, maybe, maybe national honours, and then end up a Premiership club like you did, yeah. uh, or slightly lower like I did, and. Uh, that worked, you know, that was that was fine back then. But now we've got this academy system. And of course, there's a third option as well, which is kind of almost like the US model where you, you have a, a university yeah. system where all the players go into university and then they get uh, drafted from there. Do you think there's any sort of moves to get back to one of those other systems or do you think the academy system's here to stay and do you think that's right? I think I think the academy system's here to stay. I mean, it's a shame, really, is that the academy system's getting tighter again. They've got to redo the boundaries. They, they're closing three. When really, you could argue, is there scope to create more regional academies, not necessarily academies attached to clubs? Um, you know, I think there's many different ways to look at this. But what we need, what we want to do, is we've got to realise and we've got to get a sense that the sport is a late development. But who's going to pay for it? Who's going to finance it? That's ultimate. In the old days, like you said, it was all grassroots community, county, divisional. 
and then and then national and then that then that allowed all the club systems to filter you know your grassroots up to Blackheath or wherever or you got taken to wasps or or or, or whatever that may be but all of those clubs all had a playing hierarchy within the club and that has now disappeared so i th- i think the reality is a consequence you've got a claustrophobic um bottleneck with all of these talented young players, where do they go? And and as a consequence, you're you're always going to have that academy system that that drives through from the Premiership clubs, right? And and it's not a bad thing, right? Because they're they're wide at the base. You've got the DPPs, the development. So again, your players come in, they can come out, they get exposed, they experience it, and you know the reality is the cream will rise to the top because Harlequins or Saracens or Northampton, they're a business. They're trying to attract the best English talent to, to play in their area. I, I'm not quite sure about the boundary systems because that if you, when you look at say Harlequins where they've got Surrey and they've got <laughs> Kent, you know, well, they haven't got Kent, sorry, they've got Surrey and they've got part of Sussex, you know, and there's a lot of rugby talent in those areas. And then you look at Bristol and there's very little rugby talent when how they define the boundaries or whether there should be fluidity, fluidity or flexibility for players to move to, to to different academies. I don't know. I think that's all up to up in up for debate. But I I would probably like to see a little bit more freedom of movement of players so that that you had you could create opportunities for yourself. I I would love to see and you know I'm a I'm a big advocate of of realizing and recognizing that not necessarily the best player at 18, 19 will have even touched the ball much at 14 or 15, which is when the process starts. And sometimes if you're not in it and you miss the boat, it's very hard to get in it get back in it or establish yourself in it because of the way the game is now. In the olden days, you had those boys that never played any sort of international rugby and they ended up being capped 24, 25 years old for their country. That very rarely, if at all, happens now. They don't really miss a player. Um, but is it because they're really good at talent ID or is it because it's become a, a bit of a institutionalised system whereby if you're not in it, then you can't get in it? Um, so I think there's a, you know, there's, I'd like to see a few more regional academies that are not necessarily affiliated, which then can allow players to develop. Now, the $6 million question, Tim, is who's paying for that? I haven't got the answer to that. I haven't got the answer to that, you know, but that I think would then create opportunities for players, which then may not take them to a professional club, but might open doors, as you've just touched upon in terms of the looking at the US college system, because we've got a very powerful, very strong super buck system, which I think has um, has emerged because of the swell of rugby talent and the competitive nature of, of the university sporting landscape, which I think is something we can nurture. I think it's a little bit crowded at the moment because the premiership clubs are attaching themselves to these super bucks universities and I'm like, well, you're either in their academy system or you're not. And if you're in the academy system, why are you playing Super Bucks? Now, I fully understand you might be going to that university, but um, it, it seems a bit of cannibalization for me rather than, um, you know, if you're under an academy contract, what well, maybe you should be playing at a club if you need to play somewhere then, right? Not necessarily at the university. But, you know, that's that's a point of view for me because I think there's cannibalisation there where I'd rather like to see the two things separate because I think you would see a very different maturing and nurturing um, landscape and environment. I think the challenge you have then is how you run those university systems and those university programmes because at the moment you've got probably input from the premiership clubs because there's resource because they see it as a well I might I might have missed one there or they attract one in you know let's just take Exeter right they've got a player that was in the north that's gone down to Exeter University now all of a sudden we're in the immediate Exeter Chiefs vicinity now that's not that's great for that player but it, I'm not I'm not sure we're we're getting the best out of that super buck system because the premiership clubs are involved in it rather than the Nat 1 clubs or the Nat 2 clubs or the championship clubs in those regions, they should get the benefit of those university players if they're not playing university rugby or as well as playing university rugby, which is what kind of you and I did. You played on a Wednesday and you played on a Saturday. 
So I think there's opportunity there because I think we need to find a way to to create more opportunities for these aspiring young players because they're going to use sport to get a, a head or give themselves an opportunity in the in the university world. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so something else I want to sort of discuss and attack is is something you mentioned earlier, which is this drop off. So this kind of when you're an elite player as a youngster, you get you keep going up, you keep going up, and we're seeing more and more. I think players that don't make it drop out of the game altogether, and that's something that I really like. I don't feel comfortable with. I'd love it if those players would would find the level where they're happy to play at, and I guess they feel like maybe. I was, I was shooting for the stars and if I don't make the stars, there's nothing left in the game for me. And that's yeah. kind of sad to me. So uh, what are your thoughts on that and and how yeah. we can encourage those players to continue playing? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? And I, and I think, again, the nature of the generations have changed and that's just how the world is, right? But I mean, I remember having a chat with a couple of guys. He, had, he was 21 at the time, right? Or 22. And I'd be come across to America to be in a camp. And, it, and and he was English, right? But he was American qualified. And he'd been capped at 18's level, been capped at 21's level, um, had gone to Wellington, got three A levels on a scholarship, um, hadn't worked out for him. And when he's telling me all this, he said, oh, I'm, I'm just a failure. Do you know what I mean? I might just call it a day. <laughs> and I'm like, you're what? Like, yeah, anything but that. You Look at what you've achieved. Just because it hasn't worked out how you want is not a reason to to give to give up or in, in, the, in the last one. But that's that's an old bloke telling a young bloke, right? And, you know, the reality is, is they've got to, they've got to see that. First. So where does that come from is the point. Like, wh- at what point, where is his perspective that he thinks that? And I think that's a, a lot of what happens with that kind of, that swell as you drive and you push everything at school or boy rugby and then you you push on your club or you push on at university. And then, you know, there's only so many places at Nat One clubs and championship clubs. And, and it's like, well, I might as well give up then rather than go back to your community club and enjoy the game for what it is. And, you know, there's so many other things to do instead of that. Right. And that, you know, they might want to do CrossFit. They want to, you know, we, 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 we can't, we can't hide from the fact that there is competition for us, you know, against us for our sport, for these young people to do. And we've got to continue to do a, a, a better job of staying in touch with our young rugby players that go off to university so that they have that home to come back to, which is what we we took for granted when we were, were younger, is that when you walk into, a, you know, you walk into Cold Fins now, they're like, all right, Tim, you want a beer? I go back to Bromley. That's the same thing, right? And and that kind of community and family um, perspective at, at, at grassroots clubs, I think, is is something that's still very much there. But I think clubs have got to work harder to stay in contact with what's becoming a very mobile um, population at that age level, and and realise and recognise that they do have other options and that we are in competition and, and not take it for granted. And I think that's the challenge for the game of grassroots at, because there's no, there's no doubt that say you were a young player, then you, you went to university and even let's just say you were starting in their first team, but it didn't pan out for you. And you, you come back to, or you go and find someone to work, you come back to where you're going to work and you can't fight your way into a national one club, but you could go back to your community club or play London South East 2 or, or whatever. Well, then play London South East 2 if that's the level you want to play. But if not, you know, it's not, you know, the, the juice ain't worse the squeeze. I'm going back to my community club. Well, great. But we've got to, we've got to find a way to better to stay in touch, to, to, to galvanise and to bring the, those players back into our respective clubs at whatever level. But never feel, never make, never let them feel like they shouldn't chase the higher standard if that's what they want to do. And I think that's a part of the game that we, we, we've got to work on. I really, really do because I, I, I think there are too many guys that are leaving the game that are too good. Like they, they, they're bloody good players, but they're just like, oh, I'm, I can't do, I can't do it at that level. Therefore I'm not doing it. Yeah. Which is a real shame. It's a real shame, isn't it? Now um, you kind of half mentioned this earlier, but something about having a backup plan, you know, because as you yeah. mentioned, the amount of players that make it, 
is very few and a rugby career is not that long anyway. Now, it was a, a little while ago, but Tom Wood uh, sort of expressed the opinion that actually while he was in it, that was all he wanted to do. Like he didn't want to have a backup plan. Like his mindset was, I need to focus on this if I'm going to make the best of myself and the best of my career, which is kind of an alternate way of looking at things. And with the world of work now being, I guess, a bit more flexible and people changing careers more often during a lifetime, um, do you think that's still crucial? I, I do think it's crucial to get life experiences. I do. I think, you know, t Tom was very, very fortunate. He ended up making it and, it, you know, that worked out for him, right? And he said, well, I, work, I, I play for England and things like that. But, and, you know, Tom would have maybe been very happy to then have to, when he finished, I've got five years of Ardiaca, earning a lot less and learning my, and being humble and, and, and realising and recognising that I've got to start again. And that's a perfectly good way of doing it. But I would probably say, and I would probably encourage everybody that that's in life right you need to continue to develop and make sure that you are developing as an individual on and off the pitch because that will make you better at what you do so that that would be my mantra to him that would be my reply to him and i think for young players i'm having this with, with lucas right now he's like mate yeah you, you're gonna go and be a pro rugby player but you can still study well yeah but what what, what? well no you you there's only so much time you can do playing rugby year one so as a consequence, you can do your studying as well, because there's great flexibility there right now with everything being videoed and so forth. You haven't got to be what we used to have to do, which you had to be in the lecture. <laughs> you, you've got that flexibility to manage your time as long as you manage your time efficiently and effectively. Now, you know, of course, you can you can review that ongoing. And the reality is you can you can feel you can finish a degree or you can finish an apprenticeship rather than the conventional three years. You can do it over five or six years. Hey, no problem. As long as you're developing, involving, you, you, a change is as good as a rest. And you need everybody needs something else apart from the very thing that they're focused or passionate about or committed to or, you know, just tunnel visioned on. That's not healthy. So I'm, I, I am a big believer in that because I'm, I'm all about if you develop the man or the woman holistically, then you're going to get a better rugby player. And, and also understanding and interacting with people that aren't rugby players is just as important socially, perspective, just well-being and, and, uh, and, and not having to think about rucks and kicks and so forth and what protein shake I've got to have and all of that stuff. Um, you know, and, and understanding that there's other things and other people in the world that are passionate about different things to you and being able to find common ground and build and have conversations because you are going to need to do that once the game is finished. <laughs> um, so th that's why I'm a big advocate of that. And that's why I think, you know, all young men and all young women that are entering this professional game need to have a hand on. And I, and I, you know what I mean? I think it's interesting now, I think, because like you've just touched upon in the world of the workplace, it's quite flexible and there's change of careers. I think it's very hard to know what you want to do. Do you know what I mean? Like, whereas back in the day, you were like, oh, I'm going to go and do this. I'm going to go and do that. Um, I mean, you've been fleet of foot. You've changed. You've dabbed down yourself at a, a number of things. But, you know, that adaptability, that flexibility has probably come from the sport that, that you that you played and you've, that you've learned. And that's a big positive and a big character trait of, of successful rugby players. So, you know, I, I, I think I, I'm not expecting or I wouldn't want or I wouldn't, kind of say to any young rugby player, you have to know what you want to do when you finish, but you have to be prepared to take yourself out of your cup of zone and learn different things and try different things because at some point you are going to have to do something different. And I had the same conversation with my boys in the US because, you know, it doesn't last forever. Hmm. Now then, you as a father, geezer, <laughs> uh, Lucas, as you mentioned, has just been playing for England under 18s in the recent Six Nations. First off, just like, what's it like to, to watch your lad play for, for his country? Oh, it's insanely proud. I mean, he's, 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 he's a hell of a player. I mean, he's, he's far better than me. Um, and, and <laughs> far better. I mean, the other one's better than me as well. But, it, you know, his he's commitment, his dedication to his craft has been first class. But what he's also done and what he's also, I'm really, really proud about him. I mean, he's that he's done this. He's given the same attention to his studying, and studying doesn't come easy to him. Studying comes very easy to to Harrison, um, but he's 
he's got after it and he's and he does he does the things he doesn't want to do as well which i think is credit to him um and it's it's been a very hard eight months for him because he's obviously been injured um so he's had to fight through those kind of battles you know that you know as a young man oh, am i going to be good enough again oh, do they want me no i'm injured you know all of those kind of self doubt and things that 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 young men have to deal with and and young ladies um to then get out the other side and then finally get your reward eight months later. You know, his last game was in South Africa for England and then he's literally come back and he, he got himself ready for the Six Nations. And he, he played really, really well considering he'd been out for eight months It like he hadn't been away. So credit to him. Um, from watching on, it's like, for me, it's great because as we know, I'm a bit vocal when I'm coaching on the sideline. We know, you know, let's not, but for me, I'm very, very different. I'm, I'll sit at the end, cup of tea, keep myself to myself, and that's how I want to be. Because then I'm just there as a dad. Of course, I want him to do well. Of course, I'll have words with him afterwards or whatever, but not in the moment. Um, and that's, you know, that's lovely. I enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, that's a really important point there, Giza. Why, why have you chosen to be like that? What's, what's the reason behind that exactly? Um, he doesn't need. If he needs my help, he'll come and get my help and he'll ask for it. But he doesn't need my help on the side of the pitch because what what the reality is this, I can't play the game for him. He's got to play the game. So if he's constantly looking over what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, he's not focusing on his job in hand. And we, we used to have that a little bit when he was younger and we used to have that with, with Harrison as well. And I was like, well, don't don't look at me, play the game. And then if we need be, we'll we'll have a we'll solve problems afterwards. But you're gonna to have to solve them in the moment and you'll have to have done the work before to ensure that you know what's coming. Um, and more, more importantly for me as well, as I, I'm not being blunt, I don't want to embarrass him because when I when I coach, I'm there to win. I'm a performance, I'm there to win. And, and I know that I can be passionate and I can be confrontational in when I, when I want to do that. And I don't want to be that as a father. And I learned that when I used to, do the participation coaching with Harrison eight, nine, 10, 11, right? Where I literally had to reinvent myself on a side of a pitch to move from a performance coach to a participation development, learning, teaching them to enjoy the game, but be play the game safely. But most important, more importantly, you have to deal with injustice, not malicious injustice, just injustice with interesting officiating or interpretations or naivety from people that might necessarily know as much as you do and I'm, you know, I made some errors in that as well do you know what I mean so you learn very quickly of what's important and what's not important and and that's how I've kind of approached these kind of latter years with with both of them when they're playing their sport it's all about them and as long as they're smiling having fun and competing hard sometimes you win sometimes you lose sometimes you play well sometimes you don't um and all, all I can do is be there at the end and pick the, pick the pieces up for a hug or pick the pieces up with a, a proud pat on the back. Both of the same, right? Whether you win or lose, whether you play great, or whether you don't, you're, I'm, I'm still your biggest supporter. But I'll tell you when you do well and I'll tell you when you don't do so well because you need that sense of re reality and that perspective. But what you don't need is me as a coach on the sideline when I'm meant to be your dad. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Now, we kind of spoken a lot about the kind of the, the challenges of the youth development at the moment in England. Are there any kind of changes, any sort of obvious changes that you would make going forward? Any kind of easy wins that maybe that you might sort of identify? Uh, I, I, think, I think what's becoming interesting, as I said, I think with education, sport's becoming a vehicle to get better education options, right? Be it being a, a state school kid trying to get to private school, maybe to get um, into into an uh, a better educational environment along using your sport. Likewise, using your sporting to get a better university option. Along, you know, at the end of the day, if you get your grades and you're a better rugby player, then that might be the point of difference. So, I I want to see. And, you know, it's a bit loaded because we, we're kind of, I'm kind of part of something that's doing that. I want to see these kind of regional performance development hubs that allow rugby players to come and 
get better if they want to they want to they want to take their game to the next level that's where i think there's some easy wins now the sadly at the moment is that it's kind of pay for play right it's all commercial because the reality is there's not the grassroots money to pay it or there's not the corporate social responsibility money or sponsors to do it but i think that's an area because i think then we can continue to create more rugby players better equipped to to play the game and then hopefully we we do a better job at these community we, we, and, and a lot of community community club clubs do really well but others don't they just let their players go off to university and then they they don't stay in contact with them you you, you take Isha and Chris Wilkins he does a fantastic job at Isha of staying in contact with 18 19 20 as they fly off and go and follow their lives but there's always they, he brings them back and there's always, you know, it doesn't matter how long you're away. There's always a, uh, a way back. Now that means that some will come back and others will come back and then flow back to community clubs or whatever, but he does a really good. And I think the more that community grassroots clubs can do that. And, and it's, it's, it's a thankless task. Um, and it's, it's bloody hard, but, but that's what makes community rugby and community clubs, what they are is that, the, the they care about one another even when they're not around and then they treat you like you've never been away when you come back. And I think we that's a that's a fantastic trait of our game. And I think the more we can be proactive in that and the more that clubs are proactive in that, I think, you know, we've got a very healthy mini and junior game. We're just not embracing it from juniors to that university or that flyaway bit to come back to then bring back into our senior game, be it at grassroots level or whatever. So, I, you know, and it, it's not rocket science. It's just a couple of people at each of the clubs deciding to take the thankless task on and, and owning it. And, and, and if you've got three or four clubs in little local regions doing it, then you've got your perfect little um, out of term time, little round robins. And it doesn't necessarily always need to be 15s. It could be 10s. It could be, and it can be social and it can be festively. You know, you can you can do it in many different ways. Um, and it and I'd love to see a little bit more of that. And I would love to see more regional performance centres so that players that want to get ready to try and compete to maybe get an improved uh, educational option or get ready to, you know, have they've, they've been let go by the, the DPP at the, their premiership club and might want to fight their way back in or they're trying to develop themselves to get a university option because our game is a late development and and I think that's the the opportunity yeah and of course you mentioned about educational options but so many rugby players get their jobs via people at their rugby clubs as well um I mean that's it's this huge opportunity for for young people in that respect as well it, it is and if you know if you look at kind of how the the, uh, the traditional old nat one models and you start to see it now on social media right where they're going well we can help you get job opportunities because when you finish university now as we talked about off air like the grads is ridiculously competitive and it's all automated on algorithms so it's not you don't get to meet people you see what kind of whether they're good characters they you know they're good people are they going to work hard you know you can you can play the automated system quite well and and or not so well and then you, you don't get an opportunity so using sport to get yourself a career opportunity not not you're not trying to look for a free ticket because the reality is those things don't really exist but the reality is i think that the 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 beauty of our game is is that it creates hard working individuals who are honest lo loyal will will be humble and and get their hands dirty now they're the types of people that a lot of employers are after so then you can mould them if they're bright individuals into into whatever area they choose or or know. And I think part of the issue with a lot of the modern population is they're not quite sure where they want to be. They're not quite sure what they want to do. And that doesn't mean that they're flaky or not committed. It just means that I'm still finding my way. Um, and and we've got to embrace that and and realise that that's just the way that the world is now. So yeah, rugby gives you those those kind of other avenues to explore, um, and and I think if you know if if, if you go back to the 
um, the educational pieces is, is, is how you filter and find your opportunities to plot your path. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know you've been doing a bit of coaching today, Mike, yeah. so tell me about... <laughs> <laughs> wow, is it sunny? Cool. Um, tell me about the Sporting Excellence Group and what it's all about and what kind of players yeah. you get in there. So that's... Um, it, 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 it actually, it, it was set up by you know, uh, a, a group of us, but, you know, uh, Dave Fitzgerald at, at the forefront and then obviously myself on the rugby. We've got Mark Butcher um, on the cricket. And then we've got the the football side with the um that that again is 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 different because obviously the football world is is very different. But cricket and rugby are quite same, quite the same in terms of the opportunities at the, at the top end of the sport. But obviously the different formats that you can have in cricket and rugby. But what it is 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 it is a performance kind of academy whereby players who want to get better, who want to aspire to become better at rugby and become better men and understand that you have to be responsible for your own development and we help them develop as rugby players. But by the same token, we try and help them develop holistically as well as young men. Um, and, it, and it's almost like, uh, you know, like being part of a professional academy. So, but but it's giving players opportunities who have been let go by their DPP, but it's like, that's fine. You're still a good rugby player and you want to get back to the next level. Or you want to get yourself to a point because you're at this school, but you can get after a scholarship at that school. Then you invest in yourself to, 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 to do that. And likewise as well, you're working towards trying to get yourself to a university place. Then, okay, well then can you apply yourself at the S at the SEG Academy, um, in order to get better, and I think that's that's what we're trying to do. And you know, sadly, again, it's it's very different to the Premiership clubs because they finance that. The reality is that the player themselves will have to finance, which will actually make it difficult for those that not can't necessarily always afford it. And that's always niggles me because. That's something that we're we're trying to work on. Can we can we find some corp, corporate sponsors that will CSR us so that we can that young that young man that is trying it, rugby is his way out or is his way to give himself more opportunities and develop himself. He just needs that opportunity. Is is can that be financed if he is if he has the capability and, and capacity? So that's the kind of the second piece that we're trying to build into it because at the moment, being candid, it's, it is a pay-for-play kind of academy so that they get exposure to quality coaching, quality mentoring to ensure that they're getting better week on week because we run it on an evening um, for, for, for kind of six to eight week terms. Very similar to kind of how, you know, Harlequins in the local area will work on their DPPs for their various age groups. But they've only got so many spaces. And some of these players who weren't on come to us and then they end up going on. Well, that's great. That's that's positive. Likewise, there's others that have been kicked out or been decided they're not at the standard have come and then got themselves back in. So, you know, it, it's just providing another outlet for, enough, for, for players to who want to persevere, who want to continue to get better, to, to, to fight their way forward. So... It, you know, on the, on and on rugby and on cricket, they're quite similar sports, right? In terms of the different formats that can that that are that are, that are there to be played. So, yeah, it's, uh, today was a masterclass where again we just brought brought them all in. We had about fifty five kids, and they had positional stuff for half the day, and then we worked on very specific skill stuff which you wouldn't necessarily work at school and club because the reality is you haven't got the time; you're too busy trying to get the team ready rather than focus on individual skill development. And then obviously, what, what examples of that, Giza? What kind of things? So, for example, like again, we did today, we did a lot of work on footwork into contact, right? So, understanding how you can win that contact, but the detail of using your footwork so it becomes a conscious decision rather than, well, I just ran at him. You know, getting the <laughs> sequence right to ensure that you're not opening your body up so you can, so he can get his foot in his V in your V to then dominate the, the tackle area actually is well. how do I manage my feet and where do I need to get to my feet to, to win the contact collision, but also then win the next step, the other side. Right. So they're like, Oh, okay. Uh, simple stuff like ensuring they understand ball press, what good ball presentation is, 
how you need to adjust, where you need to pop, where you need to move your body to and how, dependent on where tacklers fall and where the jacklers are. Okay, right. So again, you know, just small stuff, right? Which if you want to move on in the game, that's the key to continuity of attack. So, but, you know, what they'll run is systems and shapes at schools and clubs and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We don't, we stay away from that because they do all of that. But we try and look at the components that you can then integrate into it. We can't do that the whole day. Otherwise, they'll, they'll, they'll lynch us. So we still have to interact that with, and this is where Sam Howard is fantastic, is in terms of now now putting these elements into game situations or into fun games so you get the best of both worlds because rugby's still a game of fun believe it or not <laughs> it is all about having fun but also it's always about understanding how you can get better and make the most of of of, of the attributes you have yeah amazing lovely little bit of detail there i love that um now we'll bring this sort of to a close now geezer but if there's anything else any sort of closing thoughts or anything else that you wanted to mention that we haven't already yeah i mean i think the other thing to talk about is that with, with the power of our game and, and obviously with my time in america is obviously like the the like we've talked about the the restriction of of opportunities right in, a, in our uk game and we've looked talked about france and so forth but what you're also seeing in in our game at the moment, and again, this is probably a, as a re, as a result of what's happened over the last fifty odd years in terms of global mobility and so forth. There, there are a lot of young players that have dual qualification, so that aren't necessarily making it in the UK game, but maybe they were born in the US because their parents were working over there, even though they're both English. So they benefit from say a US passport or whatever. And they're now in the English school system, but they haven't made it. Now there's opportunities that they actually can make their way in the American game because they've got different nationality, even though they still see themselves possibly say English. Let's just say that as an example. So I think what you're seeing now is there's, there's opportunities at universities and colleges to then take advantage of that. So, you know, for example, I'm, I'm, we're involved in this other stuff, which is sports, sports fed, education, sports edX, right? Again, just in this situation, there's a it's a, a university in Richmond in southwest London, which is an American university, which you can do one of two things, right? If you've got a, an English, an English or American qualified, say, player, he might decide to do his first year there, get those credits, which then will those credits are 100 percent transferable to an American college that he might look to do in two or three years. So again, you can get that kind of global mobilization so then he can get himself over there to get himself into the American rugby landscape, be it for the sevens on the Olympics. And, you know, we've, we've had a couple of American English qualified players that have done that already and have, have started to make waves in the under 20s and the, and the sevens um, for the US. But then you've also got this other way where you've got all these USA rugby players who are even later developers because let's just say an 18 year old English player who's been in this system here. If you had a same 18 year old in America, he's probably got the rugby age of a 14 year old in the UK because he's, the, the exposure is very different, but he can, he can come and educate in the UK at say at Richmond for one, two, three years. And all of those American units are transferable back. If he wants to go, he could come for one year and immerse himself in a daily training environment there and a rugby playing program in a very mature rugby environment, like he could go and play at Richmond if he's that good, or if he's not that, if he's still low on his development, he might go and play at Staines or Wimbledon. So you can create rugby opportunities for those individuals, and then they either might stay or they might then move back and, and continue their education without having to start again in America. Because at the moment, what you're seeing with some of these American kids, they're going across to say Hartbury, and they've been, they're thinking they're going to be in the Hartbury first team and they're not. They're just down in Hartbury fours and fives where you're coached by players, not by a proper programme. So I think that kind of mobilisation for the game as a whole, which we've almost kind of associated historically with the sports like football and so forth, that's now opening up for our game as well. So you're starting to see that global mobility piece. And that also now is opening up opportunities for the the, the amount of talent that we have in the UK that might have other qualifications. And it might not be America, it might be somebody else, but those opportunities are there for them now. They've just got to hunt them out. 
Super interesting. And it's good to hear that, again, it's just another avenue for potentially keeping people in the game, which is really yeah. what I'm, I'm super passionate about. So that's great to hear. Now, normally we'd move on to the stash section, but we've done that with you, Giza, already. So reminders of people, it was episode number eight. If you want to go and find out what Mike's favourite bits of kit were, then go and listen to that. Um, but we'll close it there, mate. So it just leaves me to say th- thanks so much for your time and all the, like, the really Im- impressive insight. Appreciate it. No, mate, it's been great to be back on. I mean, he's top podcast, mate. You do a cracking job. You do an absolutely cracking job. Thank you. Just one last thing I forgot to say. If people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, well, I mean, obviously, I don't know whether this will go across, but obviously for that Sporting Excellent group, there's the there's the website, www.sportingexcellentgroup.com. Um, you can get me on social media um, at at Mike Friday 09, I think I am on Instagram and and X as it's called now, I think. Um, yeah, and then, you know, that kind of sport X stuff, sports ed X stuff as well, that's all kind of ongoing. Um, so, some of that stuff will start to evolve probably and, and come out on the on the social media platforms, um, which, which is are all interesting things that are happening. Yeah, amazing. People listening at home, I will link all of those things that we've mentioned just now in the show notes below, which you can find at amateurrugbypodcast.com. Mike, thanks so much. Cheers, mate. All righty. There he goes. Wonderful. I mean, it's loads of great insight there in terms of where some of the choke points are at the moment in the English game, but also lots of uh, kind of opportunity as well. So that's good to hear. Um, now then, if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can do all the social media stuff. But what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. So until then, get out and play.